And then you have the uh, record GUID and the current, the current ID. You have the locality information and you'll see right away. Um, so I'm, I'm not logged in right now. And so you'll see right away that our locality information is encumbered. Um, but you can see up here at the top, basic information uh, such as the county um, and then the part associated with the catalog record. So the first section that I want to talk about is this identification section. And this section contains um, not just the current ID, but the history of identifications. So down at the bottom here, this, this is the identification that got transferred um, when our data was entered into Arctos last year. So this was what was in our old database. We've started adding some publications since then and we were able to add an updated ID based on this publication down here where this was named a holotype of Chinlicelli's Tenera Testa. Um, so this is the current ID. Below that, it gives you the taxonomy, which I will um, go into detail in a bit. Um, it shows this ID, it sends you this publication. Uh, it tells you who did the ID. In this case, that was the authors of the work, or uh, the authors of this publication. Um, and the quality of the, this ID, which in this case, since it's, it was a holotype description, was fine features. And this publication, like I said, links down here. And we actually have the DOI for this publication right here. So just in the catalog record, we can click it. And in another record, we'll open up the website for that publication. So um, one thing that I want to go into a little bit more detail on is where this taxonomy comes from. So the uh, Arctos has several local taxonomies. So one of these is just a, um, what we call the Arctos taxonomy. Um, it's general, it can cover anything um, and it's um, shared by all of the, the Arctos users. And so if I go over, so let me log in real quick. So on this, on the back end, we can actually choose which taxonomy we're using. And so this shows all of the different taxonomies that are in Arctos. So you can see that we've got the, the main Arctos taxonomy as our number one taxonomy. So as long as one of our identifications is in that taxonomy, that's, that is what will show up right here. If it's not in that, then it'll show on one of these other two that we've prioritized. So to kind of explain that a little bit more, let me click on this taxon. And so this is the detail information about this taxon. So we have the publication link to it, uh, this was where the holotype was described. And this is the taxonomic hierarchy that's in the Arctos source, as well as some metadata about that taxonomy. Now, one great thing about Arctos is that it will actually show the taxonomy that are in other sources. So, for example, we can actually see the taxonomy in Catalog, Catalog of Life and GBIF, 
Open Tree of Life, and the Paleobiology Database. And any of these we can actually, um, if, if we didn't have taxonomy for this in the Arcto source, we can actually clone one of these taxonomies into that source. So the next section on the catalog record page is the media section. And so this is where you can actually see, um, actually, yeah, let me go back a bit. There's, there was one thing I was gonna, else, one other thing I was going to explain about these IDs. So if we click on identification, one other neat thing about the identification is that we can have different identification formats. So one is just the taxon name, or you can do taxon question mark, um, taxon uh, AFF, uh, you can do two taxa, um, CF, you can do A or B, um, taxon A or B. Um, you can do taxon string, which allows you to just do you can append uh, free text to your taxon. Um, and to show you one example where this is used, so you can see here we have a specimen of a dicynodont, um, I believe it's a femur. And this femur actually has bite marks on it that were identified as an um, heterodontic 90s hunti, which is an ichnogenus and ichno species. So this, this specimen actually has two IDs for it. And that, that ID format allows us to put both of those in there and have both of those be the current ID. So the next section, like I said, is the media section. So in the media, you can um, add images. Um, Arctos has uh, um, hosts images at TAC. So one option that you can do is you can upload it through Arctos and have it hosted at TAC. Um, so that media is uh, just hosted by TAC. You can host it externally. You can also include links to things other than images. You can have videos. Um, you can have links to um, external 3D media. So for example, you can put a link in here to um, Morphosource morpho, or Sketchfab, um, PDFs. Um, one example where we've got something other than a, an image. Here we've got a link to a YouTube video. This is a video that one of our curators put together of the uh, Bistai B skull. So the next section is locate locality, but um, I'll be going back to that later because I want to do a, a deep dive into how we do localities. So up top, the next section we have is collectors. And this, this section, um, the agents in this section and, and all the other sections link up to a common data table in Arctos that's shared by all the collections in Arctos. Um, so I can click on this. And 
I can see information uh, about this agent, um, a former curator. Um, I can see not only has, oh, actually, let me do, I'm gonna click on, let me go back to this. Okay, so collector Paul Seely, who is a longtime volunteer at our museum. And we can see uh, that he's associate, an associate of our museum, that he has uh, collected many specimens for our museum, but also for the University of New Mexico Earth Sciences Department, who are also in Arctos. We can see media that he's contributed and um, publications that he's done that are in Arctos that cite specimens. One advantage of having this shared agent table is that um, we can work together to make sure these agents are unique and that um, we don't have multiple records for the same agent. On the back end, um, we also have uh, information about um, our agents. So like say we have a specimen out on loan, we can enter information about their address, um, other contact information, um, and that all requires um, agent access to view. All right, and so this next field that we have, identifiers. Um, one thing we have on here is, um, so up here is the GWID. And then we also have over here, the um, format for, that has been used um, for citing our specimen numbers. And then we can put other identifiers. So we have a preparator number here. We might have field numbers if, um, for example, we inherited um, a lot of specimens from the University of New Mexico. So if it's one of those specimens, we can put that University of New Mexico number there. Um, it's really for any, any identifying number other than the collection number that's associated with the specimen. And all right, I'm going to open up a new record to show the next specimen or the next section of the specimen record. So the next section is the relationship section. Um, we mostly use this to keep track of specimens that are um, that have been observed to be associated with each other. Um, so they were collected at the same field site and um, whatever the curator observed of the geology indicates that these specimens were probably associated. We can keep track of that information here. We also have uh, links to the GBIF and iDigBio records. These are automatically maintained. And next we have the attribute section. So this specimen, um, we actually had an undergraduate intern working on this specimen and she um, read a paper that cited this specimen and pulled out all of the observations and measurements about this specimen and put them into the catalog record. So now we know that it's an adult um, and we know uh, we have the remarks from the paper about why it was observed to be an adult. We have measurements of the teeth and the jaw. Um, 
And so this, this section can com accommodate um, many, many different observations and measurements. We have a link to the accession, um, which can be viewed if um, all of our accessions are private. So those can be viewed if, if you're log in, logged in and have the correct permissions. And then at the bottom, we have um, links to different projects that have used these records. And I'll go, I'll go into projects more in detail later on in the webinar. And finally, down here at the bottom, we have parts. So the part name is we have a code table of part names that we can select from. Um, it's, I can pull it up over here. So these are all the parts that we have. There's a lot and we add on to them as needed. And you can have um, more than one part for each specimen. So as many as you need. Um, to give an example of that, So uh, this is a condylarth jaw, and down at the bottom, we can see that we've actually added a bunch of parts for this jaw. Um, our old database had these tooth codes, um, tooth formula codes in all of the uh, specimen descriptions, and we actually, um, Teresa went through and did this and coded all of them um, so that we could, so that these would actually be searchable. So now we can see, all right, this jaw has three molars that are articulated in the jaw. Um, and we can see, all right, each tooth, the right lower uh, first molar, right lower second molar, right lower third molar, and then the premolars. So um, that data is now searchable. Another thing we can do with having multiple parts is that we can keep track of them separately in the object tracking. Object tracking. Um, so our Bisti Beast, we can see that the skeleton, oh, let me log in so we can see the object tracking. Okay, so we can see that our Abyssa Beast, we've got two parts, uh, the postcranial skeleton and the skull. Uh, the postcranial skeleton is in our collection in our type room, and the skull is on exhibit in the main building. And this, this links up to um, an object tracking hierarchy that we have um, that each collection has. Um, we're still building ours, um, which is why this isn't too detailed right now, um, but this can go down to uh, a box and a shelf on a cabinet in a room. Um, so it can be very detailed and um, yes. And eventually, um, one thing we're going to be able to do is, um, so you can have, we'll, we'll be able to, for example, um, 
barcode a cradle that's made especially for a specimen, we can enter that cradle into the tree so that, for example, if the specimen goes on exhibit, we can actually keep track of separately where that um, specially made cradle is separate from the object itself and know that that cradle goes to that object. So the next thing I'm going to go into is localities, but before, before I do that, does anyone have any questions about um, the rest of the object record? Um, Nothing in the chat yet, but feel free okay. to chime in. Um, Nicole, this is Erica. Uh -huh. I have a question about, I'm, I'm not sure I'm going to ask it very clearly, so tell me if it's not clear, but I noticed on one of the records that you had an assemblage or one of the relationships was the same assemblage as. Mm -hmm. Is that tied in in any way to like your object tracking because they might be the same physical object? Um, it's, it's not. So the, those relationships are not tied into the object tracking, but one thing we could do if two objects were on the same rock slab is that we can make that rock slab a container and keep track of it that way. Cool. That's really cool. That's mm -hmm. awesome. Any other questions before I move on to localities? I have one. Um, it, you said at one point that uh, that the record or something was stored on tech or text or something. I don't remember exactly what it was. Can yes. you elaborate as to what that is? Is that a dams or a portal or something? So TAC is the Texas Advanced Computing Cluster, and it is where Arctos is hosted. Um, so in addition to having Arctos there, we have some storage space for media. And um, TAC is at the University of Texas at Austin. It's a supercomputing center. Great, thank you. So for localities, um, in paleontology, um, one of the, um, one thing about pa localities in paleontology is that it's often important to keep that information private. Uh, legally, for um, federal localities, um, and sometimes state or other, um, government and localities, legally we're actually required to keep that information private. Um, and the reason is um, looting basically um, to try to keep these sites preserved um, and so that those uh, land managers can make sure that everything is properly collected. And so um, and even on, on private land, uh, often we'll choose to keep those private as well. So in Arctos, um, we are able to keep that information encumbered. There's two ways that it can be done. Um, the first way, which is not what we do, but it's um, a way to do it, is that you can simply encumber the locality coordinates. Um, so that that will just make it so that the coordinates um, cannot be seen by anyone without the correct permissions. Um, we decided not to go that route because we have a lot of information aside from the coordinates that could be used to find a locality. So what we have done instead is that we actually have two localities collected, connected to each specimen record. 
one locality is a public locality. So we just put the information in there that the public can see. So I'm logged out right now. So you can see that we can see um, the collection event date. Um, we can see the uh, locality name that we give the locality. We can see coordinates, but um, if you look at the error, that's actually a really huge error. And that's because the coordinate is a whole county. So it's the center point of a county um, and the area radius around that. We can see um, geology information because that won't really give away the position of the specimen or the, the locality. So uh, stage age, we can see um, it's Judith Judithian, um, Kirtle information, Hunter Wash member. Um, we can see um, who originally reported the site to us and when they did that. Um, and any site identifiers that go with it. So we can see his field number. Um, we can also see that the landholder is the Bureau of US Bureau of Land Management. Um, but so so this is the public locality. And if you're not logged in or if you don't have permissions, then you will not be able to see the private locality. But if I do log in, and I'm actually going to go to a different specimen record, one that's not on public land. Now we can actually see two localities. So this is the private locality and the public locality. And additional information that we get on the private locality, um, we can see the description of the site. So what we call the specific locality, um, Kenny Brick Quarry and kind of the description of where it is. Um, we can see any remarks that we have. Um, in this case, we've got um, the UTMs in there and Scrolling down to our locality attributes, we can see not only the geology information, we can also see the um, township section range information. So I'm going to open up. the edit page for this locality. So we can, um, so I can show you a little bit more about these locality attributes. So this is the coordinate information for the locality. Um, and you can see here that we have the options within Arctos to georeference the locality with geolocate. And then down here at the bottom, we have the locality attributes. So the options that we have for locality attributes, we have uh, Biocron, um, that's where you'll find um, like the North American land mammal ages. Um, and then we have a uh, biostratigraphic zone. Um, these are both uh, linked to code tables that have controlled values. Um, we have the chronostratigraphy. Um, these are also in a code table. Um, and this code table uh, is, the code tables for these are restricted to what is in the um, international chronostratigraphy chart. Um, and they're also linked to 
the ages of um, the uh, the time the units. Um, so there's basically a, a chart in the back that um, constructs a hierarchy of these using the um, time periods. So you only have to enter one. And so you enter one and if you search for um, a higher level uh, chronostratigraphic unit, it'll come up with anything that's in one of the lower units. Uh, geology, geology remarks are where we put description of lithology or stratigraphy. Informal chronostratigraphy is a chart where we can put anything that's not in the international chronostratigraphic chart, but is, you know, it's published on, it's used. Um, examples are like regional chronostratigraphies. Um, here in the Southwest, an example is like the Wolf Campion. Um, we use it a lot, um, but it's not in the international chart. Um, it's not formal because it's not in the chart, but it's still useful and used. Uh, landholder um, links to a lookup table that's got private and then it's got um, the different land management agencies. And um, we don't have say like individual parks or things like that in that lookup table, um, but we do put that information in the attribute remark. And then we have the lithostratigraphy. Um, these are not in a kind of hierarchy, sort of like the chronostratigraphy is. So we put each one of these in there. So we've got on this page, we've got formation group and member all in there. Um, locality access is the attribute that we use to keep um, the locality private. So all of our private localities have locality access set to private. And so um, you have to have certain permissions to be able to see them. Site found is what we use to record who found who who originally reported the site to us and when. Site identifier is what we can use to record um, other ways that the site has been identified. So we have our locality number up here in the locality name field, but we might also have like a quarry name or another institution's locality number. So we can put um, that information under locality or site identifier. And we can have, we can have more than one of any of these. And then uh, we can put the township, sec township section and range information in as well. And for all of these, we can enter a determiner a date um, and in remarks. Um, so that's especially helpful with things like formation to know like who determined um, this locality was in this formation. And it's also useful to be able to have more than one of them. Um, say a locality spans um, two members. You can put both of those members in or say it, um, you know, straddles um, a, you know, a, a boundary between any two lithostratigraphic groups or, um, and actually this is a good example of this one, um, this locality was previously determined to be in the Pine Shadow member, um, but then revised study of the geology of the site determined that it was in the Tanahas member. So we were able to put both of those in and I can put the the de determiner or curator and the date he determined that and actually um, that determination is linked to a paper. Um, does anyone have any questions about locality? I see some questions in the chat. Yeah, I can read. This is from Nicole Yeagle. 
So is the dual locality system used in other Arctos collections like protected zoological specimens or just paleo? I didn't catch if the public record shares the same locality number as the protected locality. Are the two localities automatically linked? If you attach one, the other is linked to the specimen record also. Um, okay, so we the locality name for each of them, we the the private one is just the locality name, and then we append underscore public for the public version of the locality. Um, unfortunately, they're not automatically linked, so if we were to update one, we would have to update the other as well. Um, I don't know if any other collections are using this. Emily or I, Teresa, do you know? Yeah, I can chime in. So. Um, Nicole mentioned this, so you can, um, you don't have to use this dual locality system. She is using it because there's just so much data that they'd rather mask. So there are encumbrances in Arctos, and so you can mask coordinates or you can mask information below locality uh, with really simple commands. Um, but because there's just so much more information for paleo data, um, there's this kind of second option to have these, this two locality system. So I'm not, I'm, I don't think many other collections use this apart from paleo collections. Um, I think, so this whole dual locality system was just developed about a year ago. Um, and some of our cultural collections and archeological collections are definitely going to make use of it because they have the same sort of needs. Um, the sites are vulnerable to, um, to encroachment and so they want to make sure that they're kept really, really vague for the public. Yeah, great. And then we had a couple more questions. Um, Kristen McKenzie asks, are you entering one record at a time or do you have import spreadsheets that list each field? Yeah, so there are um, So we actually have uh, a variety of uh, bulk uploaded tools. Um, we have a, a bulk loader for catalog records and then a bunch of batch tools for different types of data. Um, so for example, um, when bulk uploading the localities, um, we were able to um, upload the public version of the locality and then take that bulk form and just append the additional um, data columns onto it for the private localities. Great. And then Ashley um, Lonsdell asks, do encumbrances expire? Um, the, I, the coordinate ones do, I think. Um, can yeah. one of you, I don't know All the encumbrances that. have an expiration. Yeah, so you can set an expiration date and then you, the maximum expiration is five years. So then you get a reminder if five years have passed and you still want to keep records masked. So you just kind of have to refresh that. Um, but the locality, this um, locality access attribute, that doesn't expire. So if you're using the the two locality model, um, that private locality, that encumbrance won't expire. And then we have a question from Carrie for your two geologic member example. Was one member the accepted one and the other one was the old and is one marked as preferred versus the other? Um, we don't yet have the option to mark one of these as preferred. Um, but it's something I, I, I'd like to maybe propose in the future. I don't know if it'll happen though. Yeah, I just chiming in with that. In a lot of cases, um, or in some cases, these are separate opinions. And so depending on who's looking at it, uh, the preference might be different. Um, so I think in general in Arctos, we often try to not 
uh, make preference statements unless there's a really good reason to do so. We, we kind of like to let people who are going to be using the data make those assessments. Um, but the other thing we can do is that we can we can put that determiner information in there and a remark. Um, so for this one, clearly this older one doesn't have any information about who made it and when, and while this one's linked to a, a publication. Great, I think that's all the questions we have from chat right now. Okay. So I'm going to move on to talking about projects. So um, one great thing about Arctos is we have um, what's called a project, and that's um, something that we can use to keep track of anything that anyone would consider a project. Um, so for this one, um, you can see that it was contributed by Project um, New Mexico Museum of Natural History Collections Digitization. Um, and that's the project for our database move. So clicking on it, um, we can see all of the agents associated with this project. We can see the timeline of the project. Um, this project was grant funded, but not like a federal grant. Um, if you were working with um, a federal grant that has a grant number, um, there's actually So you can enter the funded amount if you are able to disclose that. Um, you can enter, there's, there should be a place where you can enter You basically, number. Yeah, well you add a, an agent that's a sponsor. Okay. And when you do that, you can add a grant number next to it. Yeah, so you can keep track of grant numbers. Um, you have a description where you can um, write about what's happening in the project. This one's pretty short, but it can also be pretty long. And then you have a summary of the catalog records um, used or contributed by the project. Um, you get links to other projects that have used those catalog records. Um, and you can also link publications and media. So in this example, we had um, one of our interns give a talk at Spinach last year, highlighting a specimen that was part of the project. Um, so we've got a link to her video of her specimen spotlight. And um, I gave a talk at SVP about our database migration. And so we have a link to that poster in here as well. Um, another way that you can use projects is to um, keep track of when people are using your specimens. So in this example, we had a graduate student um, come visit the museum and she took some specimens back on loan um, for her master's thesis. So we have links to all of the catalog records or all of the specimens that she borrowed as well as um, she sent us some great images that she took of um, the fusilinid slides. And so we have almost 100 images uh, linked to this project and linked to the specimens themselves um, of images that she took. And eventually once she publishes her research, that publication will be linked here too. Um, if you've got someone visiting your collection, you can also create a project um, and an internal loan and add all of the specimens that they worked with while they were in your collection. And finally, um, I've also started using it for uh, volunteer projects. So we've been having volunteers do um, an at-home project where they're collecting 
they're reading publications and um, putting or uh, putting citations into an Excel sheet. And so we've started uploading those publications and citations and we've got this project to keep track of it all. So I can send this page to our volunteers and they can see everything that they, that's been done. They can see all the publications that have been entered and all of the um, catalog records that have had citations added. Um, and let's see. So we also have, let me log in. So um, Arctos um, also has the ability to keep track of transactions, accessions, and loans, and to, let me see, we can see the loan that is linked to this project. And so the loan and the project are directly linked up um, and we can see who are uh, the agents that were associated with the loan. Um, there's automatic reminders when the loan is due um, and places for remarks about the loan. Um, you can have condition reports associated with loans and things like that. And the last thing is um, to just kind of go over our search page. So this is the page that you'll see um, when you go to Arctos. This is what the first thing you'll see and this is just our uh, general search page. Um, and so there's a couple things I wanted to go over. Um, on uh, the, any, uh, so searching by taxonomy. Um, one thing that is really neat is so paleontology um, uses a lot of things like unranked clades um, and uh, intermediate ranks. And um, those, those unranked clades and intermediate ranks um, generally are not in the Arctos hierarchy, but um, so let me do, so Dinosauria is technically, technically an unranked clade, but, and even though um, like it's not necessarily in our hierarchy, hierarchies, this, this general search will actually search those external hierarchies. So um, say Dinosauria is in paleobiology database, um, this search, will um, include any identifications that according, let me search, it's coming up with all the birds because I didn't select just paleo. So it's actually going out there and using things like paleobiology databases hierarchy to find things in our collection that would be considered dinosauria. And so here we get 2,505 records, even though say Theropoda
you know, we don't have the Dinosauria rank on that, but it still finds it because it's in the um, paleobiology database hierarchy. So that, that's something I think is really neat. And then if you expand this, you can search um, things really specifically. So this, these down here will search just your preferred hierarchy, or you can um, pick to search identifications based on any of these specific hierarchies. So there's a lot of flexibility um, when searching for taxonomy in Arctis. Um, so locality, um, we have just kind of the general, this is what I use to search for our locality numbers. But if you want to search by geology, um, you can click a drop down list of the locality attributes here. And so we can go to formation and Um, oh, Nicole. Yeah. To be down in the locality attribute value. Oh, yeah. Sorry. <laughs> it's okay. There we go. So you can see it's going to our code table and, um, giving us what is in the code table. So I can click to search on a cement formation. Search. And I get all of our records from that formation. And that field can be used to search any of those locality attributes that I discussed earlier. Um, you can also search for specific parts. Um, and like that other one, it goes to a code table. It'll pull up the accepted values. Um, so I can search for a molar. I can search for, let's see, I can search for a right molar. And I see that we are almost at two o'clock. So I'm going to kind of stop there and see if there's any other lingering questions. Yeah, and feel free to chime in with your, use your microphones. Um, we did get one request from Kristen uh, asking if you'd mind sharing the workflow for the volunteer publication project. Uh, yeah, no problem. Um, let's see, I, um, I can, I'll put my email in the chat and you can just send an email to me and I can, I'll share that. Great, thanks. Any questions for Nicole? That was awesome. Um, I learned a lot <laughs> not being a paleo person. Um, I have a quick question, if that's okay. Mm -hmm. Yes. Um, so I was wondering, um, do you think, it, is it suitable also for rocks and minerals? And if so, um, would they be in a separate, would you keep them in sort of three separate sections or how would that how would that go yeah we um we also have our uh, rock and mineral collection in arctis um here we go um our our mineral collection is much smaller than our paleo collection um but so we see here here we have three thousand specimens it's in a separate portal um and um one thing that we have for the geology specimens 
is um, our, we have a nomenclature source for the um, rocks and minerals. So we've got um, the Dana 8, uh, Haysim, and Nickel Strunz for uh, the mineral collections. Okay, brilliant. That's that's great. Thank you. That was great. Yeah, and um, I'll just chime in too that we have had um, collections put their paleo and mineral together, um, which you can totally do. Mm -hmm. Um, but then uh, they later discovered that they preferred to have them separate. So um, it's kind of good to decide up front, you know, what's the best use of the system if you want them together or not, but it can go either way. Right, makes sense. Great. Um, looks like we're at two, and if there's no outstanding questions, I think we'll go ahead and wrap up. Um, oh, we have a comment from Mariel. Paleo records can be associated with minerals via relationships. So that, yeah, that relationship uh, table can associate things across collections within your own institutions or across institutions that are a part of Arctos, or at least an even hyperlink out. Um, you know, if you have minerals that maybe are at the Field Museum or AMH that aren't in Arctos, you can still at least link those. So pretty flexible in that way. And I just want to say a big thank you to Nicole. Um, and thank you all for joining us today. Yes. We'll, we'll have this recording up on YouTube within a day or so. Thank you. This was really helpful. <laughs> You're welcome. I do have kind of a, a follow up question. It's more about the tech. Mm -hmm. So I don't know. Um, I was uh, kind of looking through the website and I was wondering, it mentioned something about having a TAC allocation for Arctos. And so I was wondering about like how big those, like is that if you've, if you've got a collection on Arctos that you kind of automatically are allocated some space on TAC for media or is that something you end up having to pay for separately through TAC to support that archive um so we can i think accommodate up to a certain amount of file size i'm not I, emily or teresa do you know what that size is um but beyond that like if you were doing a lot of really really big media um you could have the option to buy your own space on tac or on another image uh hosting server mm -hmm. and so, we actually also um we could keep um, some private media on our um, museum server and it's not publicly accessible but we can actually put that file path into the media URL and so when we're in the database we can click on that and go to um, the location on our server where we've got the media. Oh great, thanks. Yeah, and so generally the, the TAC allocation um, is free up to a certain extent. So I think, correct me if I'm wrong, Teresa or Marielle, um, I believe it's a terabyte. Um, and then if, you know, if you're doing a huge project like CT scans or something, then you might have to buy extra storage. Right, yeah, CT scans get pretty out of control fast. Yeah, <laughs> right. Yeah, part of tax mission is to make scientific information publicly available. So um, they're usually pretty happy to help us host things. I don't um, think anyone's paying for attack at this point. Yeah, <laughs> no, oh, so, that's so fantastic. Wall. <laughs> <laughs> that helps a lot. It really does. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Great. Thank you very much. And yes, like Mariel said, we can also do the external links to more for source or um, like Sketchfab and things like that. Cool. Well, thanks all again, and we hope to see you next time. Thanks for joining, and thanks again to our presenter, Nicole. <laughs>